So, Seamus, what's happened in the world of video games this week? I have not played much video games, although I did play Aperture Desk Job. Oh, yeah. I, I picked that one up as well. That's free on Steam, optimized for the Steam Deck? Yeah, I, I guess it's really like... It's really kind of training for the Steam Deck. You know, it shows off all of its features. And it's even like the interface is designed to teach you about like the layout of your desk is designed to like look like the Steam Deck. But of course I played it with mouse and keyboard and it worked fine. Oh really? I I saw the little notification at the top saying uh controller required. I was like, oh okay, I guess I have to get oh, my I'm controller. Sorry. So I No, no. No, I played it I played it with the controller. I'm sorry. I, I just meant I played it with the controls that I have here. I, I can't believe I said mouse and keyboard. <laughs> I played it with I the tried. controls. It I wouldn't let me. Right. I played it with the controls I have available to me. I didn't get a Steam Deck, is what I was trying to communicate there. Okay, okay. The so Xbox controller on for me. Same here. Mm. Yeah, it was, a, it was a fun little experience, but it was pretty clearly like, here is how you use the, the thumbstick and stuff. Right. Right, and it was a little, it was a little funny when it's like teaching you about the bumper button, and it's like, yeah, I know about the bump. I'm not new to video games or to this planet. I'm just new to this particular game. But then I got to yeah. the part where you have to tilt the Steam Deck, and it's like, wait, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was a cute little thing. It was just like you are a an inspector at Aperture Science, and you have a little adventure with a dumb robot, with one of their many, many deeply dysfunctional robots. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say more. It's only 20 minutes long. So, like, if we talk about it more, we'll spoil the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of surprised how short it was. I I didn't really know what to expect, but it was, it was very polished and, uh, you know, not laugh out loud funny, but kind of like smirk funny. Exactly. I thought the same thing. It wasn't the pure charm of Portal 2, but uh, it was charming. It was funny. It had, you know, it had, it had amusing moments. Uh, yeah, it was fun. Everybody should check it out. It's only 20 minutes and it's free. If you have a controller, because you can't play with mouse and keyboard. Right. Or if you have a Steam Deck. Yeah. Although, uh... Steam Deck is like what, seven hundred bucks, eight hundred dollars, or something? Uh, maybe the top end model. I thought the, I thought the, I thought it was like cheaper than a Switch or comparable to the Switch. Oh, interesting. Can you play Breath of the Wild on it though? I have been noticing that there are games that are having updates with like optimized for the Steam Deck or like you know control options for Steam Deck and stuff. It's like okay, that's that's cool. Like I don't. I don't resent that people are going back to their old games and like, you know, refreshing them for a new platform. But it's kind of funny or it's like, isn't that basically just for like, you know, thumbsticks and stuff? Okay, it is more expensive than I thought, but not quite as expensive as you thought. Hmm. Uh, the base model is $400. Uh, and the top end model is $650. Um, but it's... Uh, you plugged it. That's that's quite a bit of money for a, that's quite a bit of money for a handheld, um, and you put down that money, and then you have to wait until third quarter of this year to get it, because they are way back, backlogged, back ordered, back there. Oh they, man, they didn't so, make enough. So they have shipped some, but like yeah. if you want one today, you have to wait until like the fall until you get it. Right, but I mean that's like. That's where piece, That's where all gaming hardware is these days. Like nobody has enough hardware anywhere. Everything costs a fortune. Mm -hmm. Well, they are building a bunch of new chip fabs in the states, so that'll be, it'll be interesting. But oh. that's a long-term solution. Those things don't spool up right. fast. Right. I was just thinking. I wonder what the. I wonder what the wind-up time on one of those places is. Like, <laughs> like it's definitely measured in years, not months. Yeah, definitely. So this week I became aware of a mod that's out. Now this mod has been out for months, but I didn't hear about it. And this week I found out about it and then I went to learn more about it and I wound up going down a rabbit hole. Oh boy. Um, so you remember Fallout New Vegas, right? 
Yeah, yeah. There's a spoiler warning uh, season about it, right? Right. And it's th the most beloved of the new fallouts. It's the least stupid, I would say. It is the <laughs> smart. You could even you could even be more polite and just call it the smartest. It answers um, the question, what do they eat, which is a good start. Right, exactly. Um it's it's not a perfect game. Uh, most of my gripes were technological and gameplay. Shooting didn't feel very good, but you know, story I really dug it. World building was top notch. And so a few months ago, a massive new mod came out called The Frontier. This has been seven years in the making. This is one of the most ambitious mods nice. ever made by a community. Um, it has, you know, new models, new weapons, new gameplay systems, new quests, an entirely new map, new places to go. I mean, it's it feels almost like a whole other game, or nearly so. Man. Um, it takes you from it takes you from the Vegas area to Portland, Oregon, um, and you you to see snow. So this is the first of the Fallout areas that isn't a desert. <laughs> and um, well, let me read you some of these headlines. Fallout: The Frontier is a god awful buster cluck. Fallout: The Frontier is garbage. Fallout the Frontier is a creatively bankrupt hellscape. Okay, so you, you're kind of getting it. Wow. Catching the. Yeah, that's brutal. And at first, I was really uncomfortable with this, like just dunking on something made by fans. Yeah. Um, and especially something that took so long. Now, obviously, work does not equal quality, but it's like somebody put in a lot of effort over a long period of time. They stuck with this, right? And you don't want it right. to be bad. I mean, this, yeah, I mean, this is a team of people. This was a large team, voice actors, mm. the whole thing. There are even some professional and semi-pro voice actors in here. Um, but there are also, like, the voice acting is, well, like the mod itself. The, the, the thing with the mod, well... Here's the thing. I was very uncomfortable with how vicious people were. I mean, people were just downright mean to this. And it made me uncomfortable. I kind of feel like a free community-made mod, maybe you ought to be a little gentler with it. You know, you have different standards when you pay a corporation $60 for a product as opposed to somebody made it out of love. And isn't asking anything but your attention. Right, exactly. And yeah, released it for free. And I feel like oh, maybe maybe you should be a little gentler. But then I watched a lot of videos on it and I gotta say I kinda was I was kinda feeling the hate too. Oh no. So let me tell you about this mod. Have you so have you actually played it? No, no, I will not be playing. I mean, I haven't even installed New Vegas, and and no, I don't have time for this. Okay. This mod has stuff that is really impressive. Somebody got cars working. Like simulation and traction and stuff? It looks great. You drive the car yourself in-game. You just... And it looks... as It isn't like... Oh, you know, it, it kind of slides around or, you know, oh, it, it handles okay. You know, it handles like a driving game in 1992 and that's all right. No, it looks great. I mean, it absolutely, you can feel the weight behind it. It has just enough inertia. You can control it, but it's not, you know, unwieldy. And just to, just to put this in perspective, the Fallout games have never... It, it, in no Gamebryo engine game has ever had vehicles in it. Right. And in fact, notoriously, would somebody... Did you hear about the train? Yes, the trolley, which is a hat. <laughs> right. The Gamebryo tools were so awful that... What was it? They... To make a trolley or a train or whatever that would carry you somewhere, there was no code for having a train 
and I guess I guess you just couldn't I guess the author of this DLC this was paid DLC from Bethesda official software developed by Bethesda right and nobody at Bethesda could be fucked to write a train code so the the authors had to do it by using the dev tools like and so how did it work they it was a hat on an NPC they stuck the NPC underground made him invincible and then propelled him along with silent explosions he was invincible <laughs> and invisible right. so the only object that can move in a game is an NPC right uh. and and that's how awful it was but how, somehow this mortar without even access to you know the code or anything managed to get cars working and it look they look great it it was very good looking there were a lot of other little uh, you know once in a while some of the voice performances are fantastic everybody's good as the core game hmm. um some new models so there are these flashes but the thing i was starting off at the beginning is the the mod itself is incredibly uneven um you know oh, here's sure you know, here's a professional voice actor pouring their heart into a great performance. And then, like, two minutes later, you walk up to a 35-year-old man that's voiced by a 17-year-old boy. <laughs> or a woman, or whatever. Whatever, right. It's like, and it's just like, you immediately break into laughter. Like, it is impossible to listen to this voice coming out of this grizzled old face and not howl with laughter. Wow. And, um... What's interesting is there are some good story beats in it and some neat quests and some cool moments and great great world building. But like a lot of Bethesda stuff, it seems like the worst stuff is at the core. Mm. Like the main quest of the experience is like incredibly linear, almost no choice, filled with cutscenes, constantly captured in cutscenes, and basically... Oh, no. And basically an excuse to chain together an endless series of ripped off scenes from other games. Oh no. It's just like um references and in jokes. I don't even know if they're reference it just feels like they're just like like there, there's the scene where you have guys in power armor in Fallout or not Fall dang it. What is wrong with me tonight? In Wolfenstein, a bunch of guys in power armor capture you. And then the evil Nazi scientists makes you choose which of your which of your friends will be killed. Hmm. And that scene gets recreated almost verbatim within this mod. Lovingly recreated in HD. Right. Actually, it's lower. It's it's lower LD. It's lower. I mean, it's this is a <laughs> not even SD. This a, right. This is like a eleven year old game or something. <laughs> um, Black Hawk Down. Um, there's Dead Space, scenes from Dead Space. Uh, there's a bunch of Call of Duty scenes. You know, the cutscene where you're betrayed and you're killed, and then while you're bleeding out, you see them shooting your all your friends or whatever. That, you know, let's recreate that scene verbatim from Call of Duty. That's what people want. Um, right. And, um, just this endless series of just the, uh stolen right from Mad Max Fury Road where somebody wrecks into something exploding and screams witness me that actually verbatim happens <laughs> uh and it's just this weird chain of like it's not its own story it's just this chain of moments from these like the, it would be very weird to experience this if you weren't familiar with the with this with whatever is being referenced and in fact, right. there's a lot of moments where you're like, oh, this is a weird scene. And when you get to those moments, it probably means, well, it's referencing something you haven't seen. Like, that's why this scene exists. <laughs> Not because the story needs it, but because somebody wanted to recreate it. It's got a boss that's a lot like the cyber skeleton boss at the end of Mass Effect 2 where you're on a floating platform and a big, the upper body of a big Skeletron monster pops over the side and tries to smash you huh so it is this work of labor of love 
demonstration of pure skill, but also terrible cringe. And the last thing against it, and the thing that really pissed people off, is that it is pervasively horny. And it's just got a lot of just... Not even romance. Just the... Just the... <laughs> oh, no. Right. A lot of opportunities for sex. There is sex. I'm going to spoil this. There is sex with the death claw, if you're interested. Hmm. Uh, um, I mean, you just like opportunities for sex and talking about, you know, uh, deeply traumatic things that you normally talk about, put trigger warnings before discussing them in, in mixed company. Um, that sort of thing is just really generously strewn throughout the story in a really heavy handed way, you know, hmm. lots of that sort of stuff going on in people's backstories and them talking about it a great deal. So it was like, you know, whoever wrote this, although this is a really intense thing and you know, that's how you make a story intense is you have intense things happening. And it's like, no kid, actually you make somebody care about a character a lot and you give us stakes that we care about and that makes it, you know, and then you don't have to, then you don't have to reach for that sledgehammer. Well, I see where the creatively bankrupt claim comes from. Yeah, but it's not just a giant pile of garbage. It's sort of this weird, sort of this mixture of stuff and not all of it's connected. You know, there are different quest lines made by different people. So there are some parts of it that are actually really good and some parts of it that are cringe and some parts of it that are a mixed bag. And it's so interesting. Um, and it, it makes me sad that it's getting such backlash because I hope it doesn't discourage future efforts. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, if you make one of these, why are you making it? You're making it because you want to entertain people. So that means some of these people worked for seven years and then all they got was hate mail and ridicule for their trouble. And that's got to sting, especially since some of them are clearly young, just judging by, you know, the type of writing mistakes they do. They, it, certainly these people trend young and aren't going to have mm. a lot of tools to deal with very aggressive criticism. And that makes me sad. It's not just for, like, you know, entertainment. I, I imagine that a number of the people who are working on this were working on it for their portfolio so they can go to submit to game development studios and be like, hey, I worked on this mod, I did this and this and this in the mod, and you can play it and see my work, you know, see that I've actually know, done something. That's true, and it still works as that. Like, you're right. I mean, you, you can't point to it as a critical success, but you can point to it as a logistical success. We executed sure. this vision. Technically exists. Right. Whoever made that car, man, they deserve <laughs> they deserve a job in the industry <laughs> somewhere. Or a nice. friggin' metal. It's just like the entire Forza engine ported in. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, 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 one of the weird things about it is the car is so good and it works so well, but where do you drive it? The whole world is rubble. Oh, no. Like, it's really easy to get stuck on stuff and there's not a lot of places to drive. It, there are some open areas where you can drive from A to B, but like, this isn't, this isn't like an open world game where you just have your car and you drive somewhere and you jump out and you have a little adventure and you get back in your car. It's... It's almost like the car is too much. The car is too good for the for the mod that it's in. Well, I'm sorry that didn't turn out, but I hope I hope people continue to try and make big mods because I admire the effort even if it and I feel sorry for the for the people that made great stuff that are maybe kind of being held back or their their work is being lost in the wave of backlash aimed at the major mistakes of this mod mm. and you know upside if you ever want to romance a mr handy now you've got an outlet for that dream come true let's do some mailbags dear diecast have you ever seen spider-man no way home what did you think of it i'm curious to know if anything about it bothered Seamus in particular but i'd also be interested to hear if you th did anything impressive or interesting i'll spare my thoughts have a wonderful and beautiful day andrew thank you andrew I have not uh, seen Spider-Man No Way Home, Seamus. Have you? I haven't. I I think we... Didn't we answer this like a month ago? 
Yeah, people keep asking about it. I haven't seen it yet. I won't see it until it appears on streaming. So, like, it's it's not possible to see it now if it it's, like, out of theaters but not yet in streaming. So, like, you can't see it? I want to see it. Um, yeah, but I can't. Next question. Hi, Die Pals. So I might be negotiating posturing. It might be negotiating posturing, but Andrew Wilson seems to be open to gutting the most profitable sports franchise in history. And there's a link to an article on Video Game News Chronicle. And he says, I know sports games aren't your top cup of tea, but FIFA is by far the best-selling video game sports franchise. According to Wikipedia, it sold more copies than Minecraft. And there's a link to the Wikipedia article. And the stated reason is that FIFA is, quote, holding EA back, unquote, from implementing other game models and making the franchise somehow more popular. This seems to me like killing the goose that lays the golden eggs, yet again, by not understanding your customers. In my experience, the reason pay annual updates to sports franchises is the latest stats and players, not gameplay innovation. Your thoughts, Contributor. Thank you, Contributor. Um, yeah, I, I understand Andrew Wilson's frustration. Um, FIFA, the FIFA organization is deeply corrupt and has a lot going on and probably doesn't give a damn about this video game series that they've sold their license to, right? Right. So if Andrew Wilson wants to do something with the game, good or bad, and they don't want him to do it, he doesn't have a leg to stand on. You know, he has no leverage. There's nothing you can do. Right. They'll just be like, well, you signed an agreement that we get to sign off on everything and we don't want to sign off on this. Mm. And so I could totally understand why somebody would be like, I don't want to deal with the FIFA organization. They're corrupt and troublesome and they don't, they, we have nothing that interests them. They just see us as a source of revenue. They don't care about the games. We can't, you know, they're. They're too much of a huge bureaucracy to even talk to them. and <laughs> Right, and, right. Which is kind of ironic, right? Because that's like the kind of things people say about EA. Exactly. Exactly. So if I could empathize with Andrew Wilson's position, but then again, his idea of we don't need the FIFA license. It's like if you don't have the license, you don't have your franchise. I mean, your franchise is called FIFA. Yeah. That, that is what it looks like on the on the cover. Uh, but I think the idea is, so I, I read the article or, or read most of it. And uh, in the article, he says, like, the only thing, this is a quote from the article, in a World Cup year, of course, we get access to the World Cup. And so his Im implication there is that they don't really get anything from FIFA other than World Cup events or, or whatever. Um, so when the World Cup isn't happening, which is, what, half the time? Or, or like, is it every four years or two years? I forget. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but so anyway, when the World Cup's not happening, uh, they don't they don't have any real reason to use FIFA other than, like like you said, it's the words on the box. Um, and then later in the article, he says, quote, in a public statement, or, quote, in a public statement released in October, EA implied that it should cut ties with FIFA it, that should it cut ties with FIFA, it would still retain all its other league player and stadium licensing because those deals are arranged separately. Unquote. Oh, so we've so, so we've still got a deal with Manchester United that we can have the license of their players and all their stats and yes. their stadium and everything. Right. You know, that's that seems valid to me. I mean, I don't trust Andrew yeah. Wilson specifically, <laughs> but right, right. Uh, you know, I imagine he wants to do it just because he wants to put slot machines into the friggin' game, and, you know, and FIFA sure. just wants to you know, cut. not pay the fees. FIFA is talking about doubling their, their licensing fee, and he's like, well, I don't want to pay that. Like, who wants to pay more right. money for the same old thing that we don't need? Right, but on the other hand, I mean, that's totally a, a, a reasonable thing to want to do. And if you can get around it, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I, I can't say I don't understand FIFA. No, like, how much does the average FIFA player care about the FIFA license? They probably care, is my team in this game? It, are my mm, favorite players? Right. You know, do the players I care about, are their stats accurate? And they don't care about the licensing at the top. That would be my imagination too, but yeah, like you said, I neither of us have any connection to this subculture 
Right. I have no. I can't even begin to guess. So I'll I'll put it off to people. I'll kick it off to people in the comments. For those of you that are into football, international football, um, what's your take on this? All right. Next question, dear Diecast. If you make a game with a deeply stupid premise, is it better to spend a lot of narrative time and effort trying to make the premise seem less stupid, or to do nothing and just quietly hope that people don't think about it too much? Also, which one of these two things does Batman Arkham City do? Thanks a bunch, John. Thank you, John. Oh my goodness. That is quite a question. <laughs> So it presumes I, that you're in this terrible situation, right? Right. Like, okay, Batman, like I was trying to I'm glad I'm glad John here provided us with a an example because I wasn't going to go for Batman. Like I was gonna jump to Fallout, because that's the most recent game that we're talking about. Like Fallout 3. Mm. And a deeply stupid premise of fighting over something, fighting a war with an army we don't care about for something for control of something that neither of us need it right. doesn't work right. a piece of right. a piece of machinery that uses magic technology to do something that's easy to do in real life it is like stacked on top of each other right all these stupid things right right um but batman arkham city okay batman arkham city there's like some kind of storm that wrecks a bunch of the city and floods it and rather than fixing it up, they wall it off and turn it into an open air, free range prison. And <laughs> okay. And is it still flooded? Is like Waterworld or something? Yeah, uh, yeah. A bunch of it is flooded. I mean, parts of it are <laughs> flooded. And really, uh, the flood I think is to justify why you can't just leave. Like, huh. there's the is it you like know, on, on ongoing flood? Because that's not how floods work. Okay. Anyway, I'm thinking oh, about it too much. Obviously. It, the, it's part of it. It's it's along the coast, so it's like falling into the water, right? This is like huh. part of the coastline. Although giving up shorefront property for a prison, like that's the <laughs> that's the most nonsensical <laughs> element in the whole thing is that anybody <laughs> right. would let waterfront property be turned into a prison. That's just economic fiction. That's impossible. Oh, man. You will you will violate the second law of thermodynamics before that happens. Oh, but anyway, well. and the story doesn't focus on it too much. The story does kind of hurry you through. Okay, here's the here's the deal, and then it just throws it into you, and you either swallow that premise or you don't. There isn't like a bunch of documents, like explaining well. Oh, the regular prison was overflowing and we had funding problems. And it doesn't have this long series of contortions and justifications to try and explain why this ridiculous thing happened. Either you're on board or you're not. And I, I have some respect for that. Like, there are, there are some things up front with a story that you need to buy up front that are, like, part of the buy-in of the story. Like that a rich man can dress up as a bat and fight crime. Like, okay, I will accept that <laughs> as the premise. Sure. That's the fee, the entry fee. Right. But then you can't just, like, introduce random ludicrous things in the middle of the story. Oh, this 12-year-old built, built a teleporter in his bedroom out of old TV parts. It's like, no, I, I can't. I can't accept that in this story, even though yeah. that's not really more ridiculous than a rich guy dressing up as a bat. It's not it, <laughs> right. It wasn't right. part of like, the entry. If this feat. was, if this was Jimmy Neutron, then like okay, child builds teleporter in room, fine. Like that's the premise. But like then don't have like a rich guy show up in a bat costume in the middle of Jimmy Neutron either. Right, exactly. And some people will will use the entry fee um, as an excuse. Like you would say, "Oh, I can't, I can't believe it." Like it expects us to believe that a twelve year old built a teleporter. That's so stupid. And it's like, oh well, you're willing to buy this initial premise, but suddenly, a kid building a teleporter is too much for you. Like they're equally ridiculous. So why are you picking a one and and not the other? And the reason is because one is part of the premise. It, just because I swallowed right, right. a large premise doesn't mean that 
the world no longer needs to run on rules and logic. Yeah. Yeah, if the if the waiter brings you a completely different dish in the middle of a three-course meal, it's not like they've they've somehow, you know, you've given your consent to like this crazy omelet, right? It's like, no, I I ordered a specific thing and I want like the thing I ordered. I don't want whatever random thing you thought of while you were making the thing I ordered. Right. Um but when you and I think there is a lot to say for not over explaining something, especially the more ridiculous it is and the more like, can you make the justification smart and pithy and easy to digest? If you require some Hideo Kojima level 20 page explanation, then don't bother. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Say it concisely and elegantly or, or not at all. Um, you can hint at things. And, you know, just, and the, the other thing is make sure it works tonally. Mm. Don't ask me to buy, don't ask me to believe in Squirrel Girl in, like, a Punisher story. Right. Doesn't fit the, the tone. Right. Yeah. This is something the anime does really well just with the title splash sequence, right? Like the opening credits or whatever. And they've got, like, little clips from the series and, like, it gives you a feel for... What am I getting into? Is this going to be magical girls? Yeah. Is it going to be, you know, starfighters in space? Is it going to be romance? And it gives you that hint and then it's like, okay, if you're on board for that, then great. We've got a show for you. If you're not on board for that, then, you know, go watch something else. And it's kind of upfront about it and it portrays it in the the manner that the, the medium is set up to portray. Um, I think a, a game that this really well was... Darksiders, the original Darksiders, where you start off with all your powers and then you get them taken away, like right right near the beginning. But you get to play with all these powers right at the beginning. It's like, okay, this is what you're signing up for. And then like, you know, you're gonna get back to that point eventually and a little bit past it. But like that's the that's the teaser, and it's like, okay, if you're on board with that, then great. We've got a game for you. Yeah, that is a that is a, a good way of handling it. It's like give the player an idea or the or the or the audience if it's you know, linear media. Just give people an idea of what they're signing up for, so they know. So you can make this premise as stupid as you want, as long as you're upfront about it, I guess. Right. D and don't pretend it's smart. Don't like... <laughs> don't. But what if you're stupid too stupid to realize that your premise is stupid? Right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the real tricky spot to get out of. Dear Diecast, what home theater setup do you have for TV and movies? Do you think will there ever be a need for anything over 4K? If not, how can we improve our viewing experience? I am just now getting around to buying Blu-ray versions of my favorites that I currently own on DVD. Thank you, Will. Um, my home theater is just my PC. When I want to watch a movie, I sit at my PC. My home theater is a uh, 1080p projector and a nice pull-down screen so we can pull it down when we want to watch a thing and then retract it oh. so it's not in the way. And uh, oh, I, I'm coming I over to used your to house. have, yeah, I used to have these two beautiful, uh, they were like 40 inch speakers sets, you know, with the tweeter and everything that my dad had had built uh, in college, and so he loaned them to me, and I had those set up, and a nice little amp, and uh, man, you could drive that, the whole house would vibrate if you wanted to, or you could turn it down, and it just like the noise filled, you know, the sound filled the room, so that was really nice. Oh man. I'll bring the chips, man. I'm coming over. Yeah, <laughs> leather couch. So, so like, yeah, that's really nice when you all want to watch a movie together. Although, really, practically speaking, most of the time the kids have the Chromebook on the kitchen table and they're watching Voltron, and I'm watching YouTube on my computer somewhere, and yep. Anna's got like political videos going on on her laptop in the bedroom while she's folding socks. So. We don't actually sit down and like all watch movies together that often, but it's nice to have when when you all want to do something together, or you have friends over, or there's an event or something. We have a TV in the living room, which is not that big, but my wife doesn't like, weirdly doesn't want a giant TV. She says she doesn't like the really big TVs. I don't quite understand why. I mean, if it was up to me, I'd want, you know, a giant wall covering television. But, you know, she right. wants her... Like, she wants to be able to watch TV, but she doesn't like having technology in her. Like, if if it, she got her wish, her living room would be, like, all bookcases and books and antique furniture and pillows. 
you know, mm. that look. Some candles, a globe of the world, and in, in, like in the hobby. Right. right. She wants her living room to feel like a library or something, or a study. And mm. I, I think a great big plasma TV or a great big 50 inch OLED is just like, doesn't, she just doesn't like how that feels. <laughs> big old black rectangle. Exactly, exactly. And she spends the time, I, I never spend time in the living room unless I'm watching something with her. So I sort of, so, you know, she's in charge of whatever goes space. on in the living yeah. room. Yeah, it really is. Um, and so we have a, a very modest television out there. Hmm. Like, it's only a little bit bigger than my monitor. Yeah. If, uh, if you ever want a really big uh, display that... Uh, that you can put away easily projector I'd, I'd strongly recommend because it's you know it's mounted on the ceiling it's right out of the way and uh, you just roll that thing up and it's you know like three inches along the ceiling and the rest of the wall is just you know whatever you want there yeah my wife actually the wall behind the TV my wife has painted um, in the style of Calvin and Hobbes like that watercolor Bill Watterson Ooh. watercolor stuff. So it's like it's it doesn't have the characters Calvin and Hobbes, but it has like a tree and bushes. It's a nice little scene covering that entire wall of the living room in that oh, style. Wow. Yeah. So you can kind of see why she wouldn't want to cover that with a black rectangle. <laughs> right. Well, you could always take a picture of the wall and then have that displayed on the black rectangle, you know. It's like <laughs> right, a see-through. The, the, right, right. <laughs> You can even animate it a bit? Oh, that'd be really cool. Well, I'll just put the, the huh. you know, the bootleg image of Calvin peeing on something. I'll just put that on the TV. <laughs> I'm sure she'll love it. Put a camera in there so that it's watching and doing uh, head tracking. So then when she looks away, it right. like, displays a different image out of the corner of her eye. All right. So 4K, do you think we need 4K? I've, I've never really experienced anything. I, I've got a 2K monitor, but I, I never really got hooked on it. Uh, and now I'm back to 1080 same. and it's fine. Same. Yeah, same, same. I've got like a 2K or whatever. But 1080 is, is more than enough for my old man eyeballs. And these days, uh, when I'm gaming, I care more about frame rate than resolution by a lot. And when I'm watching mm. a movie, I mean, you know, there's only so much my internet connection can deliver. And even if I could have even if I could appreciate 4K, um, watching 4K would mean choking off the internet for the rest of the house. <laughs> Everybody else can watch everything in 240p because I'm watching 4K in here. Like, it's just... <laughs> you don't have gigabit fiber straight to your house? Right. We do not. We don't have great... We don't have super great uh, throughput here. I mean, we have enough that we can all watch 1080p content on our separate screens. But if I were to bump mm. that, uh, you know, three of us, watch, in fact, I think all four of us, my, my mother lives with us, and I think all four of us can watch 1080p content at once and it's no problem. But if I started watching 4K, I'll bet you everybody else would suffer. Yeah. Um, so, 4K uh, is if not, how can we improve our viewing experience? I mean, the thing that comes to my mind is like individual VR displays so that you can you can have a, an effectively higher resolution without having a higher resolution display. Um, I'm excited for OLED screens just because their blacks are so much more black. Mm, yeah, um, uh, that and that is the downside of a projector is the black levels are not great. Right. And I'm excited for OLED, but it, it's way too expensive for me these days. And they're, they're still in the early, like OLEDs burn in pretty quick. Given the amount of use, I mean, you know, mine's on almost all day. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would burn an OLED out in a couple of years. And given how expensive they are, that's just not a good use of money. But yeah, I'm looking forward to the day when when OLEDs are a little cheaper and last a little longer. And uh, that's that's my next step to improve my viewing experience. Tuned phase array audio would be sweet for individual delivery to people. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Phase plasma rifle and forty watt range. <laughs> uh, I I don't know what the thing is you just asked for. 
it's like uh it's like directional audio but it's electronically steerable so instead of having like a, a like a directional bullhorn or whatever pointing to each person you just have an array of speakers and then they're the phase of the sound is adjusted so that the like a specific sound can be delivered to each person oh cool so you don't have to shake the whole house in order to hear it clearly right exactly and each person can have a different volume level and all that stuff that's that's another that's another thing with our uh, with our setup is that my wife has a certain degree of hearing loss she has tinnitus which means she mm. now she can hear she has conversations just fine she doesn't have a hearing aid, aid or anything but often she she always watches movies with subtitles you know even when they're in english right and um just because she misses bits of it you know, in a movie, there'll be, you know, shooting while people are talking, and I can hear it just fine. But for her, those two different sounds just bleed together, and it all turns to mush, and she has no idea what anybody's saying. And so, um, what I would love... The, the, the thing is, when there's um, subtitles on the screen, I can't help but read them. So when we watch movies together, I end up just <laughs> reading the whole thing. <laughs> and then I'm like, if I really like it, I'll be like, okay, now I'll go watch it for real. <laughs> On my screen. See what was happening on the screen. Um, because I can't stop. I can't stop looking at subtitles. My eyes just sit at the bottom of the screen, like afraid to miss this. I'm done reading. I could look back up and see what's going on, but like, I have to actively concentrate to move my eyes back up every time. Hmm. Mm hmm. So, um, I would love they they have technology at the movies where. One person could put on glasses and see the subtitles, and other people just don't see them. Special glasses that enable you to see the subtitles. I would love a, a technology like that, where you could selectively see or not see subtitles. Hmm. I don't know if there's anything like that coming to home theaters, and I probably wouldn't be able to afford it, but that's something that I would personally find useful. I feel like... Just buying two monitors and having the same video playing on both at the same time would actually <laughs> would work a little better, but who knows. Right. Uh, another thing that I feel like we could improve our viewing experience with would be to have real-time rendered movies, uh, basically like in-engine movies instead of like pre-filmed movies, because then you could change your perspective inside the movie and, you know, do all that stuff. Basically make our movies like games people keep making trying to make games like the movies but i feel like it should be the other way around people should try to make movies in using game technology so that we can have more customization and stuff so it'd be like uh you know that's interesting they don't even do that with cutscenes in games there's no reason in a game cutscene why they couldn't let you have a spectator cam but they always right. lock you exactly. they always want to do this the cinematic thing which i understand you know for certain kinds of cutscenes it's like okay to create a mood i want to put the camera right here with the light coming in just at this right spot but like a lot of times it's clear that they don't care and they just want to have talking happen <laughs> right yeah yeah and and if that's the case then why not just give me a spectator cam and let me zip around the room like a housefly exactly i think that would be a better viewing experience although who knows Dear DieCast, how would you define accessibility, quote-unquote, in relation to video games? People generally seem to discuss it as considerate options for people with physical impairments, such as colorblindness, deafness, etc. Do you agree with this narrow view of the term, or would you like to extend the meaning further? And if so, to what end? Kind regards, Andrew. Thank you again, Andrew. Well, okay, be very careful with that question um, when you put it down, Paul, because that question is loaded. Yeah, so... This is a tricky one. I saw a Twitter thread. I'm not even on Twitter, but somebody linked it from a website somewhere. And it was it was somebody that beat Dark Souls with like a rhythm control, like like the bongo controller or something. It was a one <laughs> yeah. input controller. It was just insane. It would like you beat it using Morse code or something. It was just this ludicrous wow. achievement. Beat the whole game with that. And when he was done, he tweeted something like, you know, Dark Souls should should include easy mode. Because that's an accessibility option. 
And that, of course, started a flame war. But it was interesting. Of course. That, because he had done the... Normally, it's just shut up, get good. But nobody could use that. Nobody could shut him down with that. Because he had just personally beaten the, this game in this insanely difficult way. So people kind of had to engage with his argument a bit more. Instead of this lazy like, dismissal. I am good. But and but seriously, guys. Right, yeah. No, seriously, I'm better than all of you. <laughs> I just demonstrated it. And it still needs an easy mode. And I thought that was an e um, interesting argument. The, this guy's uh, position was that even an easy mode is an accessibility option. You know, you've got people that just can't. Uh, you know, uh, you can imagine somebody with just some sort of... Um, neuro, um, what's that called? Like when you're, um, what's the one when your your hands shake? Oh, sure, palsy or something, neurological degeneration. Yeah, that that sort of thing that makes it, you know, you can do stuff, but you, you it's just much slower for you. And he, this person was making the case that hey, maybe those people would enjoy a little Dark Souls. Um, hmm, I don't know. I don't know that wouldn't that wouldn't make the game more appealing to me but it would probably make the game more accessible to some people maybe I don't know so I guess I don't know where to draw the line between accessibility and just hey here's a feature I'd like to have cuz I don't have any accessibility issues myself and so I feel like I'd be speak I'd be speaking for people with problems I don't understand hmm I have pretty serious red green color blindness um, and so like in Valheim I find it very difficult to keep enough red mushrooms on hand because they're red and the forest floor is green and I just don't they don't jump out at me I can see them if I'm looking right at them it's like oh yeah those are mushrooms but like it doesn't jump out to me as like oh here's the thing that you can collect so uh but I've never really felt like a game needs to go out of its way to to like make itself easier for me to play um yeah, yeah, this is a really loaded question. To make it even more loaded, in the United States, there's a federal law that's called the Americans with Disabilities Act, which says that you have to accommodate, you have to make reasonable accommodation for people with disabilities. And so, like, this question could be construed as a political question as well as, as a <laughs> loaded gameplay one. You know, I said I didn't have any needs. I do kind of have a, a, a small need. A small consideration that I need is that I am photosensitive to all oh, right I flashing lights and yeah, stuff yeah fla really bright flashing lights I cannot handle them they give me migraines and um, I'm always afraid like I mean that's like theoretically that means I would be susceptible that I could develop seizures or whatever mm. I mean that I mean that spectrum of problems and Usually games either warn you, hey, this game's really flashy and I can just avoid it, or they give you a way to shut it off. Once in a long while, I'll run into a game that, without warning, will just strobe the crap out of you without, without warning and without a way to shut it off. And that's really, like, upsetting to me when it happens. Uh, just because it's dangerous. <laughs> like, Right, right. It, yeah. It would be really cool if people sold like a monitor accessory that you could put in between the computer and the monitor that just like keeps it from doing that right because that's a that's a, that's something that you could detect at the software level right right now it, what would have let's see what would it be it would be like it would detect the screen's mostly dark then it goes to bright which is okay you're allowed to do that oh two frames later you want to go to dark again actually i can't let you do that <laughs> I'm just gonna like have to like freeze the screen or have it fade out slowly or something because yeah, you could just have the... persistence right have, and you get uh, ghosting right. or whatever but it's like no yeah, it's fine like that's what I want to prevent myself from being disabled by debilitating he migraines right interesting though I haven't gotten any migraines since I uh, was in the hospital last year going on blood pressure medicine stopped those headaches really? I haven't actually yeah, I haven't played any strobing games since then, just because I avoid them. It's just 
you know, I'm used to avoiding them. But I am curious if I'm still sensitive to them because I haven't had, yeah, right. it's been, I've been having migraines since I was 12 years old. And except this last year is the first time in my life of, you know, since I was 12 that I haven't had migraines. So that's interesting. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think accessibility options are good, but I acknowledge on one hand, accommodating every possible problem in every possible game is not feasible. Like, it's not possible for every indie out there to fully develop and test every possible, oh, you need one-handed controller or left-handed or right-handed or uh, every possible kind of color blindness and, and every possible kind of disability and every possible kind of hearing impair, you know, hey, hearing and visual impairment. Like, there's no way every indie could meet that standard in every game. And some games are just can't be adapted but at the other extreme that's no reason to never try and everybody takes yeah, this yeah uh, everybody takes this absolutist well well you can't do that so that means you can't play games shut up and go away and at the other extreme it's like no everybody must accommodate everything all the time and i'm like can we just be encouraging like hey you added these accessibility options that's great you're awesome Thank you. <laughs> we don't have to send hate mail to the people who don't do it. Right. Yeah. Positive reinforcement is, is sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. We, we don't have to, to start a war to get what we want. I remember I really... uh, Jonathan Blow was talking about accessibility in The Witness, and he said he got a bunch of hate mail and, and even some death threats from people who were like, you don't have accessibility options in The Witness, like, how dare you, you're a terrible person. And he's like, it's a game about color. Like, I can't put colorblindness mode in a game about color. I, I'd love to. We tried. We did, like, he's like, we did a bunch of research, and we, like, tried to figure out if there was a way that we could do, uh, what was it, a, a game for, like, I, I forget what the mechanic was, but there was some sort of thing where it's like, you know, can we like accommodate this this disability? And it's like, no, we we couldn't figure out a way to do it, and we're not going to change the game just to accommodate the few people who can't play the game. So, like, sorry guys. Right. The the I I know exactly the part he's talking about. There's a it's a, it was an amazing. This is the first time any game's ever done this. You're looking through. You're looking. Oh, I remember at what it was. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I remember what it was that he tried to do. Yeah, colored dots. You're looking colored dots through a tinted window. So you look through a yellow window, and white and yellow dots will both look yellow. But, like, red and black dots will both look black, say. Mm. Um, and that's... But, like, when you get a... So you... You could not see the unadulterated version of this pattern. You could only look at it through different tinted windows. And you had to figure out what was going on based on those different views. Yeah, and, there was and one of them, and spoilers for the witness, one of them you had to look through two tinted windows, and so it's filtered twice, and right. you can only solve the problem that way. It was just, oh, it's so good. Oh, it never been done in a video game before. I've never seen that done. You couldn't do it until we had better grab like you could wouldn't have been able to do this um like 20 years ago the rendering would have just been too primitive like there wouldn't be tinting of the under underlying pixels it would have just added a, a sort of um glaze <laughs> added additional color on top of it it wouldn't modify the colors that were already there like you needed mm -hmm more it, you needed better color color handling for it to actually work and especially looking through two tinted windows at once it couldn't have been done until now and it was brilliant <laughs> yeah and i believe that in the witness the game was actually doing the the like the rules of the puzzle in real time so like if you couldn't just see the solution and then walk up to the puzzle and solve it you had to actually solve it while looking at it through from that one particular place because that's the only place where it, the image on the screen would be parsable by the puzzle solver where it would tell you that you got the right answer. It's It, it was some really cool stuff that they did in that game. Oh, what a fascinating game. Filled with great but ideas. I remember and then he said that they were, yeah. yeah, they were trying to do, uh, they did a research project to see if there was a way to make a puzzle that could only be solved by people with colorblindness. And, uh, and they couldn't Ooh. figure out how to do it. 
Oh, but that would have been amazing, right? Because it's like, you know, then you'd need reverse accessibility options. Right. All right. So, yeah. Let's see. Do you have time for another one? Let's do one more. Dear Diecast, have you ever had interaction in a game that turned into a logic slash programming problem that you could not shake? Uh, and he's got Dyson Sphere Project. Let's see. I know both of you tried Dyson Sphere Pro Program. But uh, you talked about it back in Diecast 369. Paul posted about his introduction. To, he introduced me to it. A recent episode added. Okay, so a recent update added the automatic piler, which stacks cargo. And this addition has created a nested logic game programming puzzle. And I'd love to have an answer if you have one. My Diecast question is: You are both programmers. Has a game ever put a pointless logic bug into your head in a way that crashed your brain? Steve C. Thank you, Steve. That is. Uh, I don't think that. That's ever happened to me, Seamus? I don't even know what that would be. I guess the closest for me would be Space Chem, uh, when there were a couple of puzzles, a couple of the challenge puzzles off the beaten track, and uh, you could solve them. There were several different ways of solving them, and one of them was to like make a, it was basically like make a big old buffer, and then just like dump all the byproducts in the buffer so that they didn't pollute the rest of the product chain. And, uh, but you could also, there were, there were several other ways to do it, but some of that stuff, or like you create this little tiny, you know, do it with a, the minimum number of necessary operations. And so you have to like have it recursively grab and drop this thing to move it around and, and add all these different molecules onto it. Um, some of those got, got really involved. Uh, I don't know if crashed your brain is quite the right way to talk about it, but some of those did get very involved where I had to sit there and be like, you know, stare at the ceiling for a couple of minutes, <laughs> like try something and then stare at the ceiling for a while again, just to try to like parse what was going on in, in the solution that I was trying to implement. I'm trying to think of the puzzle games. I haven't played that many puzzle games and I haven't played that many puzzle games that I, that I felt like really did something unconventional. Like usually when I when I run into a puzzle game, it's like, oh, one of these again. Oh, an order of operations puzzle. The Witness is one of the first games I've run into in decades that like felt like it had new puzzles and wasn't just like old puzzles, you know, re you know, with new graphics. Right. You know, for so many years, it's like, oh, here's the redirect the laser beam puzzle. Here's push a block onto a button puzzle. Here's a maze puzzle, order of operation puzzle. Oh, <laughs> Tower of Hanoi again. Yeah, the Tower of Hanoi. I mean, I love me some Tower of Hanoi, but I've done that puzzle now a few times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Mist, Mist did some stuff that I feel like people haven't really uh, in, integrated into the, the suite of standard stock puzzles. Uh, a lot of mechanical stuff, figuring out interface is like a, an interface um an interface puzzle there's a lot of stuff in the mist series which i feel like people don't do very often right i did like that about mist where it often felt like the machine felt like it made sense once you understood it it felt like a machine that somebody built and it made sense to them and they didn't document it because it made sense to them <laughs> right right it's that feeling of of debugging somebody else's bullshit code that was just fine as far as they were concerned. But they threw yeah. it together and, and it's close enough. Yeah. Mist is brilliant for that. Uh, Steve, to answer your question um, below the, the break, uh, he says, by the way, the puzzle in DSP that is stuck in my head is, if it is possible to output a fully saturated belt stacked to four with fewer than six pilers, using nested loops the answer unfortunately steve is no it's not possible because if you just think about the inputs you need four belts coming in to get a full stacked four belt output and so that's four pilers right there and then the four piler outputs are all going to be half stacked belts and so you need at least two more pilers in order to fully stack that so you're going to have to have at least six and uh there's no way to do it with with nested loops i mean just, there's just there's no way sorry all right, hopefully that made sense to somebody. <laughs> okay, we have finally worked our way through this mail. Look at that. That's a proper mailbag episode. Six mailbags. That's a respectable mailbag episode. We've finally done All it. All right. 
Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. If anybody wants to find out if Seamus is still seizure sensitive, then you can send them a code for Bayonetta 2. Go for it, guys.